start start sharing. Um, again, we're thanking. Well, we're, uh, he's yes. We're gonna. It, Mary, Mary, Mary's in charge now. She she's the computer. She's our IT person now. So sorry. Um, when, the, when the Dodgers win seven out of eight games, then they're uh, Mike's Dodgers. Who? Belly's doing good. Everybody's doing good right now. Everybody's hitting. So he's not hit. Justin Turner's not hitting. So, uh, but yes, we're we're all very excited about. Or not all. Who? Oh yeah, Heaney. Yeah, he's our first injury for the season. So yeah, we've already had a. But um, yeah, it's it's almost an embarrassment of riches. You almost feel guilty rooting for the Dodgers right now. Almost, not quite, but almost. It's crazy. It's crazy. Just crazy. It's even crazier. I went to opening night last week, just before, just before, yeah. And um, I will tell you this: the reception that Freddie Freeman got when he got that first hit. Oh yeah. Uh, I was there with my daughter Dina, who came up from San Diego to be at that game. Yeah, she watches every game. She's a huge fan. She's going to two of the games. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to tell you she's going over Shabbos, but yeah, that's her priority. My daughter. No, I mean she celebrated the holiday. Listen, I gave her the Passover brownie recipe yesterday. She's she's keeping Passover, but um, and she told me she doesn't want. She's not going to have a you know she's not going to have a hot dog or beer at the at the Dodger Padre game. And they have a lot of beers there, by the way. They have like a beer night every Friday night. But she's uh, she said I'm not going to do that, but I'm rooting for the Dodgers. And she said. Um, she said when she saw Freddie Freeman get cheered for, she said she started to tear up. She said it was it was like the kind of thing that makes sports, uh, you know, where it crosses over into into uh, like people care. Uh, he had a, another homer today. Anyways, that's our Dodger. That's our Dodger report. But it is it is uh, definitely feels like springtime, and I kind of like not having days off. That's my thing. I'm sure if you're a player. It's not easy, and they and they've been showing Robert a lot too. I've noticed on during the games they're, they're yeah. focusing on him and talking about Robert Van Skoyek's uh, contributions to uh, yeah, yeah. to the Dodgers because they they recognize you know they're 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 working hard. Anyways, um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, start reading. We're at the chapter forty one, very beginning, which is also the beginning of a Torah portion, Miketz, and the word Miketz literally means. Uh, after or after the passing of and then the word two years uh what's interesting about this and i I just gonna flip back real quick so you can see this we've been reading over the last few weeks one torah portion and this is again i say it every week so what happens when you read the torah as part of the the weekly parshas you have to breeze through this way too fast because believe it or not, the Torah portion that we're talking about that we just finished last week, Vayeshev, starts at the beginning of chapter 37 with Joseph and his coat. There it is, the ornamented tunic. It's definitely more, yes, it's definitely more pronounced. There, there are parts of, of Exodus that are... Um, also very rich with things but yes genesis almost every chapter is a separate well is a story unto itself yep so this i mean literally if you think about what transpires from the time that this begins to the end now there's something to be said for that too because if you read it as a unit the story begins with joseph um you know kind of as a child, as a teenager, young man, and then it ends when he's roughly, well, it, ru it ends roughly 11 years later. That's the way the portion ends. But think about what happens during those 11 years. He gets sold into slavery. He's in slavery. He gets accosted. Oh, yeah. 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 He goes into the House of Potiphar. Then, to the, after the Potiphar's wife, he goes into prison. He helps, the, he, you know, he helps the prison people. He he interprets the dreams, 
and now he comes out. So 40, chapter 41, where we're picking up right now, is the beginning of a new idea, some new, new, uh, new stuff happening. But the last words we read last week at the end of chapter 40, it says the chief cupbearer did not think of Joseph. He forgot him. And then it begins after two years time. Now it's almost mid mid it's almost mid idea, but it also would be a great place to fade out. Well, maybe you could argue at the end of this previous line, um, But, but there's something to be said for finishing with that last line, which basically lets us know that he doesn't remember him, right? He doesn't remember. Him. Now, I mentioned this last week. This almost seems to be a supernatural occurrence. Like this is almost God wiping his memory. Like I like to, you know, like to say, just, you know, he shined the, uh, that little light in his, in his eyes, like men in black, and he forgot everything. So this isn't, this this is repeated the line actually has a both positively and negatively he did not well not positively and negatively but the but the not he didn't lo zakhar and then the other positive word which of course isn't positive vaishkahehu which is he forgot him so not only did he not remember him or not think of him zakhar really means to remember but whatever. It's either way. He did not remember. He did not think of him. He forgot him. And the repetition of that is, again, it was almost miraculous that he couldn't remember him uh, and that God literally made him forget him until the time was right. So, so God did this. This was interference that God had. So he wasn't thinking about him. And, and to some extent, that does seem to be like, that seems to make sense because this guy literally had a near-death experience. I mean, he was almost going to be killed. And he gets out of prison to some extent. You know, he's thinking, oh, wow, Joseph just foretold that I'm going to come out of prison. I'm not going to be killed. The, the chief cupbearer, I mean, the chief, I mean, the chief uh, baker gets killed. Here he is, the cupbearer, the, the butler, the guy, the food taster, whatever you want to say, the drink taster. He's probably thinking to himself, I came real close to dying. How do you forget that? That's not something that people usually would forget. It's just too much. Now you could say, well, he wanted to forget it. You know, I, I just don't want to think about that time in my life anymore. You say that, but is it really possible to do that? And so there seems to be a conscious or maybe even a willful um situation that goes on here of within god yeah were you going to say something Mike? well just reading that line who, who's telling the story i mean how do we know that he forgot him well assumedly he forgot him because because joseph well, well, here's the thing, all right? Because what Joseph says, when Joseph says, think of me when all is well with you again, and do me the kindness of mentioning me to Pharaoh, so as to free me from this place. So, you know, Joseph, at least at that point when he says this, is he's thinking to himself, this is my ticket out of here. If this guy tells Pharaoh, then I can get out of here. So two years go by and nothing's changed. And so what it tells us is, is that two years later, the story picks up. And so again, you come back from commercial, you come back from the fade out and time has passed. How do you show that time has passed? Joseph looks older. Two years in prison are going to age a guy. Two years in prison is like 10 years 15 years on the outside sometimes. Guy comes out. I mean, when he, when he does come out, it's another two years have passed. He went from being 28, as you're going to see. Well, we know that because it says he's 30 when he comes out. I mean, again, 20, 
if somebody told me that from the years um, 28, 29, whatever, that I had to be in prison for a crime I didn't commit during that time, that would have been pretty sad. I bought my first house during that time. I had a child during that time. I would have been pretty bummed out if somebody had told me that some of the more productive and special years of my life are going to be spent behind bars. And so what, what happens here isn't after two years, the guy remembers him. After two years, it says, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. When out of the Nile, there came seven cows, handsome and sturdy, and they grazed in the reed grass. But presently, seven other cows came up from the Nile, close behind them, ugly and gaunt, and stood beside the cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, gaunt cows ate up the seven handsome and sturdy cows. And Pharaoh awoke. So that was something that caused him to wake up from the dream. So he has the dream, but he wakes up. Which, of course, means that he can remember this dream. And this dream is something special. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Seven ears of grain, solid and healthy, grew on a single stalk. But close behind them sprouted seven ears, thin and scorched by the earth, earth east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven solid and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke. It was a dream. Now that is a pretty powerful recollection of a dream. The way the story comes to us is that Pharaoh wakes up twice after both dreams. And the way that the second dream has, is, has said, the first dream it says that he awoke. The second time it says, whoa, sorry. Pharaoh awoke. He ne halom. It was a dream, which seems to indicate that the dream was so real to him that he wakes up not even realizing that he was asleep. Like, it, like it's so real that he wakes up and he goes, wow, it was a dream. And some of us have had that experience before where we really weren't sure when we woke up that what we just experienced really didn't happen. And so this is very powerful. Not only has Pharaoh had two dreams back to back, but they woke him up. And the second time, it seems it was so powerful and so vivid, so lucid that he is not even sure it was a dream. The next morning, his spirit was agitated and he sent for all the magician priests um, of Egypt and all its sages. And Pharaoh told him his dreams, but none could interpret them for Pharaoh. So if we look at that phrase, the reason it says magician dash priests is because the word that they use for them is hartume. And hartume is the word that we sometimes use in the Bible for magician, seems like they are. And sometimes it seems like they're courtiers or counselors or people a part of Pharaoh's inner circle. It also says they're his sages. So there, there are two groups of people, not three. There's two groups of people, Khartoume and also Chachme. Chachamim, Chacham means wise people, sages. That's why it's translated as sages. So these are kind of two groups of people. Um, and it basically is saying that Pharaoh is asking everybody for help. He tells him his dreams, and nobody could interpret them. I don't know. To me, these dreams are not that hard to interpret. I'm not a dream interpreter, but it seems as though the dreams, like some element of it, seems to be kind of obvious. I don't know. I mean, we know the story, so maybe I'm not being fair to the Egyptian priests. 
but it seems like they're missing it. Now, as we're going to see, you know, Joseph is going to step up, but there almost seems like, again, God is a little bit involved in this in making sure that it, this is Joseph's time. So there are there is this kind of understanding like, yeah, these priests were kind of like also wiped of knowledge and ability during this moment. This was mo this was Joseph's moment. Writings, you knew how it ended when you were writing stories. They added they added this. Sure. Uh, the priests come back in the time of Exodus when they're doing the challenge with Moses and trying to see whether Moses is really powerful. So these are magicians, dream interpreters. These are powerful people. They were seen as, at the time, probably the smartest, uh, most powerful people in the world because Egypt was the most powerful country in the world. And yet here they are, they're stymied. No one could help Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, all right. The chief cupbearer then spoke up and said to Pharaoh, I must make mention today of my offenses. Once Pharaoh was angry with his servants and placed me in custody in the house of the prefect together with the chief baker. And if you look at the note there again, it says, see the note for 37, which is Potiphar is the prefect, the Sar Hatabahim. And so it's what Potiphar does. Potiphar is responsible for prisoners of the Pharaoh. So this is what he does. And so when Joseph recounts this, when Joseph says, uh, when, uh, the, the, uh, when the chief cupbearer recounts uh, Joseph's situation, he, uh, he tells Pharaoh right off the bat, look, you remember that time that you placed me in custody? Um, and if you think about it, at that moment, Pharaoh is reminding him of, I mean, he's reminding Pharaoh of his screw up or his, I mean, he didn't screw up, but Pharaoh thought he screwed up. Pharaoh thought he tried to kill him or, you know, whatever. Pharaoh was angry with him. So to some extent, you can understand why the cupbearer hasn't mentioned it. Because what he has to do when he mentions it, it says, I have to tell you uh, my offense. Now, is his offense the fact that he got thrown into jail? Or is his offense that he never remembered Joseph, right? But he has to remind Pharaoh, you put me in jail. Which is never a good thing to remind Pharaoh. Hey, you remember that time I was in jail? So he says to Pharaoh, we had dreams the same night. He and I, each of us a dream with a meaning of its own. A Hebrew youth was there with us, a servant of the prefect, and when we told him our dreams, he interpreted them for us, telling each of the meaning, telling each of the meaning of his dream. So again, each respectively had a dream and each one had their meaning interpreted. He told them, interpreted it for them. Now notice how he describes Joseph. He calls him a Hebrew youth, Naar Ivri. It's fair. He speaks Hebrew. He's from Canaan. He's a Hebrew. He doesn't know that he's also the son of Jacob and a follower of God or anything like that. He's, ethnically, he's a Hebrew. Perfect identification. Totally appropriate. But notice how, what he calls him. He calls him a servant of the prefect. He doesn't say that he was an inmate. He says he was the servant of the prefect. That's Potiphar. That's not the chief jailer. That's the Potiphar. Potiphar was the Sar Tabachim. The other guy was the jailer. What does the King James say? So, so the King James at least retains the idea that Potiphar, and again, I'm just going to show you real quick. Um, when we first hear about Potiphar, it calls him Potiphar, a courtier of the Pharaoh, and the Sar HaTabachim. 
So we know that's Potiphar. And when he describes, when, when the cupbearer describes Joseph, he doesn't say he was an inmate. He doesn't say the guy was in there accused of rape or anything else. He says that he was Potiphar's servant, which is what he's been since the moment he came there. So it's very interesting that he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't say anything about Joseph other than he's a Hebrew and that he's essentially been working for, for Potiphar. So it's interesting. And as he interpreted for us, so it came to pass. I was restored to my post and the other was impaled. The guy was successful at interpreting the dreams. He did it. I know. I saw it. And I saw what happened to me, and I saw what happened to the other guy. I saw what happened to the baker. So the next line says, Thereupon Pharaoh sent for Joseph, Vaishlach Paro, Vaikra, and he's called him, yeah, and he called him, and he was rushed from the dungeon. That's not actually a great translation. What's the King James there, Mary? What, what does it say? And thereupon Pharaoh. No, thereupon Pharaoh. How would it say by Islam? Yeah, they're both there. Now he sent and called. Again, I don't know if that's important that it says Vaishlach Vaikra, but the important thing is, is that he's brought there fast. That's for sure there. He was rushed from the dungeon, which, by the way, the word that they use there for dungeon is very interesting because it's the word for boar. And the reason that they translate it as dungeon is because it means the hole. And what's interesting about that is that that has a reference, right? You know where I'm going here. Not just to where he was for the last several years, but the very first moment that he got thrown into the hole. So this word that's used here doesn't say we rushed him from the prison, but we rushed him. And that's why it says from the dungeon, from the boar, because the sense, the sense of that word is from the hole, from a dried pit. It's the same word. It's an empty well. So the hole. And he had his hair cut and changed his clothes, and he appeared before Pharaoh. And all of that is important because it says that he changed his clothes and he appeared before Pharaoh. And he had his hair cut, right? So he's made presentable. He, having a guy from the dungeon come up, can't just right go to the Pharaoh. What? They bathed them, yeah. Changed his clothes. I guarantee you that's not what the King James says about they changed his clothes. What does it say for that? His raiment, yeah. Because the word that they use for, for clothes here, it's an okay word to say his clothes, but there does seem to be a sense that what he actually got put into was not just clothes. It doesn't say the word begadav, which means his clothes. It says Simlotav. And the word is uh, Simlotav goes back to not the coat of many colors, but actually goes back to clothes that are fancy clothes. And which is why it's translated as raiment and not just clothes. So the King James actually preserves an interesting idea here, which is he almost gets put into the word for a, a Simla is a dress. It's the same as the Hebrew word for dress. So he doesn't just get put into clothes. He gets put into fancy clothes. And not only fancy clothes, but the kind of fancy clothes that a royal person would wear, maybe in Egypt. You've seen those pictures of the kinds of the dresses that the pharaohs wore in, the, in those uh, pictures of, that we have of them, the hieroglyphic, the carved hieroglyphics, or even in the statues. I don't know if he was the first cross-dresser, but there's definitely a sense that Joseph has always been one to be more into elegant clothes and to elegant uh, and, and almost, again, effeminate to the point of effeminate dress. Now, it doesn't mean that that's the case here because Egyptians would have been wearing that. But there's a real question whether Joseph feels more at home 
dressed up in that kind of clothing than he did back in the day when he was a shepherd boy back in Egypt. And that's one of the things that the rabbis point out is that he always liked fancy clothes. He always liked to dress up. He spent some time in prison to toughen himself up or God wanted him to toughen up a little bit, but you never can take the dandy out of Joseph and his desire to wear fancy clothes never went away. So uh, they definitely have that teaching about, about Joseph. But again, he's made presentable, the very least. He's put into very nice clothes, it would seem. And he comes before Pharaoh. He finally then is brought. So he's vayishlach, vayikra. And then it says, and after all the other stuff, vayavo, that he comes before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. Now I have heard it said of you that for you to hear a dream is to tell its meaning. And so Pharaoh right away says to him, what's happened? I've had the dream. No one can interpret it. I've tried. No one here can do, no one here can do it. So he doesn't say to him flat out, I have a dream I want to share with you. He says flat out to him in the beginning, I've had a dream and no one here can interpret it. And he also tells him, and I hear you, you can. So right away, He's basically telling him the story, which is no one else here can do the job. Let's see if you can do the job. I've heard you can do the job. So it's much different than coming into the interview and saying, what can you do for us? He's being told right away he can do it. That's what he's been told. You can do it. Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, not I. God will see to Pharaoh's welfare. And that's the word here, shalom Pharaoh. The peace, the welfare. King James says what? Answer of peace. You see the word shalom. Now, all those capture the idea that Pharaoh will be okay by what happens. Now, what's interesting about this is that the dream is scary. Pharaoh's scared. There's no question he's scared. He didn't just have a dream and I want to know the answer. He's scared from the dream. And, and Joseph says right off the bat, it's going to be okay. You'll have peace. You'll have shalom from this. He also tells him, of course, right off the bat, it's not me. It's God. And God will see to your welfare, your peace, good things for you, your wholeness. You'll be whole. It's such a weird phrase if you think about it. The last part we just read. God will see to Pharaoh's welfare. The fact that we're reading it right now during Passover, when all we read about on Friday and Saturday nights is Pharaoh getting bombarded with plagues. Different Pharaoh, different situation, different, different time, if you will, different set of circumstances. But Shalom Pharaoh, the peace for Pharaoh, is what Joseph brings. And a few generations later, Joseph's nephew, grand-grand-nephew, Moses, is going to have a whole another situation for that Pharaoh. And it isn't peace. So there's a real irony, though, that we have this line here, which is the Shalom Pharaoh, that Pharaoh, this Pharaoh, will have good things happen to him. Well, it's, it's there in the Torah. It's always there. It just so happens to be a little ironic that we're reading it this week, that we happen to come up on this line, Pharaoh's goodness, Pharaoh's welfare, Pharaoh's shalom. Not later on, which I guess only goes to show you that Pharaohs are going to get what they deserve. But some Pharaohs, some Pharaohs have a chance and maybe deserve the opportunity to have good things happen well, to them. Yeah. So there, there seems to be that. So keep that in mind. Mike just said, again, this Pharaoh seems to have a different feeling about maybe God or open mind. Yes. So um, let's see this. But again, it shows you it's not the person. 
I mean, it's not, you know, the, it's not the position, it's the person. It's right. It's not the Pharaoh being Pharaoh doesn't make you hard hearted. Doesn't have to, because this Pharaoh, different kind of Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. When out of the Nile came up seven sturdy and well-formed cows and grazed in the reed grass. Presently, there followed them seven other cows, scrawny, ill-formed, and emaciated. Never had I seen their likes for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. Well, that's slightly different than the way it was described in the dream, but it's his interpretation. He's already given you an interpretation. He's already given you his insight, which was, I was really scared by this because I've never seen cows this sick in Egypt. By the way, it's kind of implying that here in Egypt, we don't have cows like that. Other places might have cows like that, but here in Egypt, I've never seen one. I've never seen a cow like that. It's terrible, horrible. And the seven lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven cows, the sturdy ones. But when they had consumed them, one could not tell that they had consumed them, for they looked just as bad as before. And I awoke. So it's a little different, a little different, but you get the idea that he's already, he's already interpreting his own dreams. He's already giving his spin, which is, it didn't matter that they ate, they're still emaciated. In my other dream, I saw seven ears of grain, full and healthy, growing on a single stalk. But right behind them sprouted seven ears, shriveled, thin, and scorched by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed the seven healthy ears. I've told my magician priests, but none has an explanation for me. Yeah, you can't help me. And by the way, what's interesting about this too, in recognition of Passover, the Ain Magidli, they can't tell me, they can't interpret, they can't explain it to me, they can't tell me. The Magid is what we call that step, that fifth step of the Seder, where we begin to tell the story. So here's the word Magid in the Pharaoh's, coming out of the Pharaoh's mouth, a little Passover little Passover connection to, which I might have never noticed because I don't know if I've ever read this story at Passover. You know why? Because this part of the Torah, just so you understand when we normally read this, is the week of Hanukkah. We always read Miketz during Hanukkah. So this is a portion that we read during Hanukkah. There's a lot of people that draw connections, Hanukkah connections. It's not easy. It's much easier to draw Passover connections here in Egypt with a pharaoh and you know, the backdrop for how we got it to Egypt in the first place, a lot more Passover connections. Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. Pharaoh has been told what God is about to do. The seven healthy cows are seven years, and the seven healthy ears are seven years. It is the same dream. The seven lean and ugly cows that followed are seven years, as are also the seven empty ears scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I have told Pharaoh. Pharaoh has been shown what God is about to do. And so what Joseph does here is tells Pharaoh that the dream you had is a very special dream. Because you've been told by God what is going to happen. God has given you a message, a prophecy. He's told you what's going to happen. Immediately ahead are seven years of great abundance in all the land of Egypt. After them will come seven years of famine, and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten as the land is ravaged by famine. No trace of the abundance will be left in the land because of the famine thereafter, for it will be very severe. As for Pharaoh, having had the same dream twice, it means that the matter has been determined by God and that God will soon carry it out 
And so he tells him, because you've had the dream twice, it's not a possibility. Maybe this will happen. Maybe God's thinking about this. It's a possibility. Maybe it can be changed. He says, the fact you've had it twice means it's going to happen. There's no question it's going to happen. It's already going to happen. It's, the die has been cast, and it's going to happen. As he says, it's going to happen soon. It's happening soon. So he tells him, you've been given, Pharaoh, insider information. It's going to happen. It's going down. Now, what do you do with that information? So now Joseph takes it to another level because he doesn't only interpret the dreams or tell them what's happening. He tells them what to do about it. Accordingly, let Pharaoh find someone who's discerning and wise, whom you can set over the land of Egypt, and let Pharaoh take steps to appoint, appoint overseers over the land and organize the land of Egypt in the seven years of plenty. Let all the food of these good years that are coming to be gathered, let the grain be collected under Pharaoh's authority as food to be stored in the cities. Let that food be a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which will come upon the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish in the famine. So he tells him, he tells Pharaoh, this is the way you now act on this. You know this is going to happen, so this is what you do. And so now what Joseph has done, and maybe this is why Pharaoh called together two groups of people for his dream interpretation, is he might have called in the Hartume, he might have called in the priests, the magicians, the wizards, if you will, for the magical interpretation, for the prophecy element of this, to try to figure out what does it mean? What's the mystical meaning of this? But the wise people might have been brought in for the second part of this, which is now what do we do about it? We know this information. We've heard this prophecy. What do we do now with that information? And so Joseph now just did both of those things. Joseph has not only interpreted the dreams, he said what to do about it. So he's actually fulfilled the role. Joseph has fulfilled the role of interpreter and sage, advisor. So, again, those are two sets of skills. They're very different, and not everyone is good at both. Not everyone would even be expected to do both. We've seen that Joseph has amazing skills, and we've seen his dream interpretation. And to some extent, we've seen that great things happen when he's around. It happened in Potiphar's house. It happened in the prison. That He's able to have an, uh, an effect on a positive effect on the people that he's around. But what we see now is that he has the ability to not only see the future, but to then figure out what to do about it. And not everybody has that gift. I mean, and I mean, that's okay. Either of those gifts are pretty wonderful to have the ability to prognosticate and the other ability to know what to do with that information. So if you have both of those, it's amazing. So he does. He's, he's, got, he's got both gifts. He's like a guy who can both pitch and hit. He's, multi, he's got multi-use uh, and mm -hmm. has proven his, he's proven already he is far and away unique in the land of Egypt. And what happens? Oh, and again, um, Harvey has an interesting question point. Why seven? And again, seven is, is a symbolic number throughout the Bible. And it means something, obviously, when we see the number seven. But in this case, what's even more important is that both the, the years of abundance and the years of famine at seven years is a cycle of time, which is pretty significant. 
a lot of stuff can happen in seven years. And, you know, whether God, you know, whether this is part of God's plan, that it's a seven years of abundance and seven years, and you know, people, people used to say that the real estate market was on an eight year cycle. It's not, it's not the case anymore, but people would look for cycles in the economy and they would say, you know, this is a, you know, this happens every 20 years, every 30 years. I think most of those cycles or most of those, those, um, those, uh, attempts at, at, at seeing if there's patterns in the economy, at least in our economy, don't, they don't seem to work anymore. Uh, there's there's uh, definitely inflationary cycles, but I mean, we're living in one right now, but there's other, they're not predictable and they're not, I mean, even if they are predictable, they don't run on cycles of set number of years. This is remarkable because we're told it's going to be seven years and that's a significant amount of time. So if a famine lasts for two years, that's terrible. But if a famine lasts for seven years, there's a lot of people that are going to die. So if you know that the famine is going to happen and you can avoid it by stocking up for that, I mean, that's tremendous. And it's going to save lives. And of course, for Egypt, it's going to wind up meaning that Egypt is going to get very wealthy. Let's read what Pharaoh does. And of course, Joseph has essentially now also written his own ticket. The plan pleased Pharaoh and all his courtiers. And Pharaoh said to the courtiers, could we find another like him? A man with divine spirit. And as Mike had said, it seems like this Pharaoh knows God or respects God because he says, Ruach Elohim Bo, divine spirit. So it's very different than the Pharaoh that's going to oppress us, who has no respect for God, no respect for the Jewish people, the Hebrews, enslaved them. And maybe, again, even his father or grandfather enslaved us. But this Pharaoh definitely seems to understand God or respect God and definitely has uh, a sense that something here with Joseph is... He's in contact with God. Now, this has led some people to believe that what is represented here is two, two different dynasties in Egypt, a shift in, in dynastic structure, which did happen at a certain period in, in Egypt. There was a time when Egypt was actually ruled by people from outside of Egypt, from the Middle East in the area of where Canaan and where those areas were. They are called the Hyksos. And we know about them because the Egyptians wrote about the Hyksos dynasties, dynasty, which was a series of pharaohs who were not Egyptian. They were not from Egypt. They were from places where Joseph and his family were from. So some people feel that this reflects that. Whether or not it happened during this time, there seems to be this sense that maybe these were pharaohs that would have been more predisposed to Joseph and to the Hebrews and to that style and to God. And maybe, if not, if not Adonai, at least Elohim, those gods or that style of God, the God of the gods that were maybe more familiar to the people of, of Canaan. So that's a possibility. It, 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 the problem is, is if we try to line up the Hyksos dynasty, it was earlier than, than and we know about it. I mean, we have the archaeology. I mean, it's not a question. It doesn't line up exactly with the chronology of when Moses then would have left, uh, uh, even a few hundred years later. It doesn't quite line up exactly at the right time. Not far, but not, not it's hard to line it up. So... It's a possibility that people knew about this, that they kind of embellished or, 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 or worked off of that story. We don't know. But it does seem to be that this Pharaoh is at least open-minded, as Mike said, to God. Yeah. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all of this known to you, and again, 
is God, Elohim. He doesn't say a God or the God. He says Elohim. He says God. There is none more discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my court, and by your command shall all my people be directed. Only with respect to the throne shall I be superior to, to you. And so here now for the third time, Joseph has been put in charge in the land of Egypt. He was put in charge by Potiphar. He was put in charge by the chief jailer. And now he's been put in charge by Pharaoh. Why? So, so what's going on here? So that's why some people feel that this is a, pre, a guy who would be predisposed. So your point was, I mean, I don't even think when you said it, you realized this line's here, which is, yes, he's very open-minded to God, even more than, than, you, than you, you, when you said it, I don't think you realized that this is actually here. So yeah, it's a hundred percent a very good possibility that either he's open-minded to God or the experience of his dreams. And then Joseph telling him what happened, I wouldn't say it made him a believer, but you know, he, he's at least open-minded to it. And may, maybe it did make him a believer. Maybe this guy is now saying, well, God's God knows this stuff. Look, he doesn't deny it. He doesn't like, he's not, he doesn't question it at all. He knows that Joseph spoken the truth. He knows it. I understand that. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't say your God. It doesn't say since it says since God. It says Elohim. I, I, I'm telling you, Joseph, Joseph is, they believe in Joseph. And because they believe in Joseph, they believe in Joseph's God, or at least the power of Joseph's God. So again, was it somebody who isn't is connected? There's another theory about what's going on with Egypt, which is that there was a period of time when the Egyptians had transitioned to a monotheistic deity under Akhenaten's, uh, the, the, the Pharaoh Akhenaten, who, who, who literally started worshiping only God, one God. Now, the problem with this, again, it's possible, it's slightly off because Akhenaten had a son who people know a lot more than Akhenaten. Akhenaten had a son named Tutankhamun, and Tutankhamun, well, it's, it's before, but not way before. The interesting thing is Tutankhamun didn't live that far away from, from this period of time. So Akhenaten really upset the priests of Egypt, so much so that people think that he got killed by the priests who were very upset that he had taken them out of office and taken them out of power and said, no, we're all worshiping God. Now we're all worshiping the sun. And that's the only God. There are no other gods. So it was a big religious reformation. Now it didn't take, or at least it didn't take long enough because it all got reversed and he, and people hated Ankanon and he, and he ended up, you know, they ended up trying to do away with all of his existence, even to some extent. And then Tutankhamun came into power and he was very young when he became Pharaoh, he's a kid. And supposedly, again, he was very pliable and, and the priests controlled him and he did whatever the priests told him. And so they were able to reinstate themselves and get their power back. So it wasn't very long, but we know this happened. I mean, the Egyptian records are there. It, it was such a, it was such a important re reformation that people were looking to try to say that, that, that this is actually what was the basis for monotheism in the Bible. So much so that it was such a pervasive idea 150 years ago, 120, 150 years ago, that Sigmund Freud actually wrote a book called Moses and Monotheism, which basically asserts this idea that, that Freud had, and Freud was not a historian, but he, he liked history and he was interested in what elements of the Bible could be scientifically proven or he's backed up. And so he said, look, I, I think he, he wrote, I think that Moses was actually one of these believers in one God 
that had been disenfranchised once Tutankhamun took over. And, and that's what the story is really about. It's really this, the Bible is really a story of, of, a, of, of an Egyptian who decides to get out of the country and go start his own religion where, an, where he can get away from the, from the rest of the Egyptians. So that's, that's what his hypothesis, it wasn't his hypothesis, there were other people talking about it. He just wrote about it and he was so well known that people paid attention to his. Correct. You know, the basis for that is the fact that the Bible says he was raised as an Egyptian. So it's, it doesn't take a lot of steps to go, he wasn't a Hebrew. The whole story of his birth narrative where he was actually, if you pull out the fact that he was put in a basket, then he was always an Egyptian. The problem, of course, too, with Moses is that he has an Egyptian name. Um, we don't know what his Egyptian name was because Moses is only part of the name. He was either a Ra Moses, a Tut Moses. He had an Egyptian god at the beginning of his name, and the Bible took it out. And so he, he was Egyptian enough that he had a name. Moses is not a name. Moses is part of a name. So Moses means from or, or descended from or from. So Ra Moses means, Ramses means from Ra. Tut Moses means from the god Tut. We know that there was a god. It's, it, it, his name was not Moses. There was a god's name before his name, and the Bible didn't want to preserve his name because it, they don't want to preserve the name of a pagan god. But he had a name that was something before Moses. So that's the theory. Now, the other possibility is, yeah, there were Hebrews that lived in Egypt. The, the Bible, you know, doesn't seem to have any issue telling us that Egyptians and Hebrews mixed. You're going to see that in about two seconds that Egyptians and Hebrews mixed. And so it's possible that there were Egyptian Hebrew mixed people. Because look what happens here. Further, Pharaoh further said to Joseph, see, I put you in charge of all the land of Egypt. You're in charge, right? And removing his signet ring from his hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand. And he had him dressed in robes of fine linen, more clothes, more clothes. And these are really nice clothes. And he put a gold chain about his neck. Wow. So he's got pharaonic Egyptian jewelry around him. And he had him ride in the chariot of his second in command, and they cried before him, Abrek. Thus he placed them over the old land of Egypt. And if you look at the note, what does it say about Abrek? It seems to be very cl close to the word Baruch or Barech, which means to bow or bend the knee. That's what the word Baruch, we say it means blessing, right? That's what we translate it as. But the, the origin of the word is to bow, which is why we bow when we say Baruch because it actually means to bow we bow and baruch means we bow or bless but people when they see joseph they crawl before him a breck bow before him and look what else he does to him pharaoh said to joseph i am pharaoh yet without you no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of egypt you're in charge. And Pharaoh then gave him the name Zaphonath Panea, and he gave him for a wife, Osanat, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. Thus, Joseph emerged in charge of the land of Egypt. And so Pharaoh changed his name, Zaphonath Panea. Hmm. which has at its root god speaks or creator of life right god speaks he lives or creator of life essentially it's a very powerful egyptian name and he also gave him for a wife osnat and it says that she is bat poti fera hmm. priest of on kohen Kohen, right? Means priest. On. That is a city. On is a city. 
the city of priests in Egypt. And we know where this is. We know where On is. And we know that she is the daughter of the priest, which means she's not just Egyptian. <laughs> she's the daughter of a priest, which is interesting because a few generations later, Moses is married to the priest, the daughter of the priest of Midian, Kohen Midian. So these Hebrews, our ancestors, aren't just married to Gentile women. They're married to very religious Gentile women, or at least from families of very religious Gentile women. And of course, the problem here with this uh, description of Osanat is that she's the daughter of Potiphera, which sounds very similar to Potiphar. Now, the, the issue is, is that Potiphar was not a priest of own, and his name is slightly different. It's not Potiphera. His name is Potiphar. Now, it's very similar. The, the, the name is it's not the same person. It's almost exactly the same. If we look at, at Potiphar's name, uh, it's not this Potiphar. one. Uh, now, is that a name or could it be a, a title? Uh, no, because the title is included there. Yeah, that's true. So it seems as though uh, Potiphar, let's just look at his name. Um, Let's see, uh, Potiphar. So you can see his name is Potiphar. And it's not quite the same spelling, but it's very close. And, and here, it's one word. The other one, it's, it, it's, it's uh, hyphenated. So, so we talked about the fact that he might have been a eunuch. Well, if he was a eunuch, then this guy can't be the same Potiphar unless he wasn't always a eunuch. And so there is this understanding that Potiphar at some time became Potiphar when he had his um, part of his genitals removed. Uh, it's probably not likely, but it's a midrash that wants to rectify why do we have a Potiphar and a Potiphar? They say very close. And they don't like the fact that we really don't know anything about these people. And so the Midrash always tries to find a way to rectify these things. So they like the idea that Potiphar and Potiphar are the same person. Um, again, um, this guy's a priest. The other guy was a, a, a part of Pharaoh's inner circle this guy would still be pretty high up, but it also says that this daughter, Osanat, and one of the reasons the rabbis like this idea was that if Potiphar and Potiphar's wife had a daughter, that means he doesn't get to marry Potiphar's wife, but he comes pretty close. He has Potiphar's daughter who looks just like the mom, which is pretty creepy and is definitely a little of a Mrs. Robinson kind of situation. So I don't know what to say about that other than they kind of like that idea a little bit and that you know i don't know it's a little creepy i guess but the idea is that potiphar's joseph couldn't be married to potiphar's wife but he could be married to potiphar's daughter look the rabbis don't like that we don't know anything about these people they don't like the fact that joseph marries the daughter of a priest of own they don't like that at all at least the priest of Midian, the Midianites, as we remember, are descendants of Abraham. They're Abrahamic. They're Hebrew. They probably spoke a language similar to Hebrew. They're close enough. They're relatives, if you will. Or can't, they're close. Not the Egyptians. Not this. They can't have this. This really freaks them out. So there's got to be some way of getting this all together. <laughs> So there's another theory, or another midrash at least, which is that, yes, Potiphar was indeed a eunuch and couldn't have kids, ever. Couldn't have kids. So Osnot is adopted. She's adopted. Well, of course, he's a, he's a eunuch. He can't have a kid, but they can't adopt a kid. 
And what the rabbis really dug deep, really dug deep for this one, is how could they have found a woman? Well, they couldn't have a baby that would be worthy. They, this Egyptian priest or this Egyptian person could never have a baby worthy of being married to Joseph. So where would this girl come from? She's adopted. And who is she? Does anybody know? Corey in the Midrash, who Osnot really was? Anybody know? This wonderful Midrash? Does anyone want to guess? Because there is possibly a child floating out there, which we never knew about, but there is a possibility. Anybody? So there's a wonderful Midrash. Oh, I say it's wonderful in its amazing uh, imagination. Is that Osnot was miraculously brought to Egypt and wound up in Potiphera's house brought by an angel. And that Osnat was none other than the daughter of Dina. The daughter that she had was Shechem. They had a kid. They had a daughter. And that daughter never died. They didn't know what to do with her because she's the daughter of a rape situation, whatever. She's Shechem got killed by, by the rest of the family. This poor girl, what would happen to her? It's not her fault. She was brought into the world through this union that never should have happened. And then families murdered. But. So it's okay to marry your niece? Oh, 100%. That's not a question. That's why Mordecai could have very easily been married to Esther. That's always out there in the story. And we're not even sure that they're. They could also have been cousins rather than just, and that would have been no question. They could have been married. He does seem to have raised her, which doesn't seem quite appropriate, but that marriage is not prohibited from the standpoint of biblical law. I didn't say that. I didn't encourage that. And I didn't say that that should be done. I did say that that was wholly acceptable and it would have not raised an eyebrow for the rabbis to say that Joseph married his niece, who wouldn't have been necessarily that much uh, younger than him, because Dina was um, older and was part of Leah's children. So she might not have been that much, this child might not have been that much younger. So it's not weird from that standpoint. It's weird from the other standpoint that it's his niece. But at least by our sensibilities, I guess. Um, but he never knew her. He never would have ever encountered her because he was down in Egypt for the last, as we're about to see, 13 years. And uh, we don't know what happened to her for the last 13 years. She was adopted as, a, as an infant. At the, but again, how does she just get there? So that's why the angel has to bring her. Baby. Could be, could be. It doesn't ever say that they're that she's adopted. The rabbis just didn't really like the idea that a priest's daughter would marry Joseph. I, I will tell you that almost any story for the rabbis would have been better than this. They do not like, they, they were really hard to figure out how a priest of on uh, would wind up with a, a woman that would have been acceptable to be married to Joseph. Because remember something, they're not just going to get married. This isn't just like, oh, he's married to an Egyptian lady. No. Exactly. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Leaving Pharaoh's presence, Joseph traveled through all the land of Egypt. He's going to go on a fact-finding tour. He's going on a tour in his new power. And he's 30 years old, which means, again... He, this is 13 years since he left. He was 17 years old when his father sent him to look for his, his brothers back in Canaan. 13 years he's been sitting in Egypt as a slave, as a prisoner. 13 years, as I said before last week. Can you imagine having your age from 17 to 30 to lose those years of your life? Some of the best years of life. For us nowadays, it's years of college, years of starting a family, starting just, I don't know, sowing your oats, 
that's a oat, oat sowing time for most people. But man, this guy's had to be in prison, had to be a slave, had to be literally, you know, precariously close to death several times. And that's the way he spent his last 13 years. During the seven years of plenty, the land produced in abundance. And he gathered all the grain of the seven years that the land of Egypt was enjoying. And he stored the grain in the cities. He put in each city the grain of fields around it. So you can see what he did. He gathered them together. Let's see if this note. Yeah, I mean, it says the seven years in the land of Egypt. That's not, it's not that important of a note. But basically, again, I mean, that's what it says. It's it, the seven years were happening in Egypt during that time. And he stored it in the grain. He stored the grain in the cities. And he put in each city the grain of fields around it. And so he made sure that the cities had grain storage and also grain production. So both of those things were going on in the cities. Which, by the way, I want to point out, the assumption that the cities would have had this normally isn't the case, because one would assume that large parcels of arable land were not necessarily right where the city was. Even in those days, arable farmland would have been placed further outside of the city, would have really been in the country. Because the areas where people would take their, let's say their flocks to might have been right outside. So like the first land that you would come to would have been where they took their, their sheep and goats and stuff like that out to because remember, they needed to have those animals nearby. They were there was probably, you know, little in the cities there were, you know, everybody had a little you know, a little, um, little manger in the back where they kept their animals. And when their animals needed food, you know, they would go out, maybe take them out, maybe let them graze, bring them back in. Those would have been the first arable lands or, or, or non, you know, non built up areas, however you wanted to, to visualize it. But to actually put farmland right in front of you was not necessarily what cities did in Egypt and wouldn't have been considered good use of the land. They might have said, look, that area, that's the first area, that area right outside our city wall, when we expand, that's where we're going. No, basically said, we're going to put our production of food is all we're thinking about right now. And so that's what he did. And also, again, the fact that they're going to store this stuff. So they have to create storage for all this grain. Egypt was known as a grain producing area for thousands of years. Up through the Roman era, this was the breadbasket for Europe. They would literally bring in grain from Egypt to import to Rome. When Alexander the Great conquered this area, that's one of the reasons why he conquered it. He didn't care about having, I mean, he, they liked the fact that they controlled this ancient land with the pyramids. Those pyramids had already been there for thousands of years. Pretty magical land. But there was an economic imperative. When Mark Antony and Cleopatra fight Augustus Caesar for control of Egypt, it's because they, at that point, the two of them controlled the breadbasket for Rome. And they were really, really scaring the Romans by saying, we have your grain production. So this was a big deal. Egypt had that land. They could, they could do things like this, but they didn't always do it. They didn't always put it right around the cities. And that's why it says they did it around it. They surrounded the cities with fields. So Joseph collected produce in very large quantity, like the sands of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, 
for he could not be measured. So again, what he did was amazing. And we already know he has a great touch for these kinds of things. He's able to, again, produce so much grain that he can't even count it. It's that successful. You're going to have to save it up. And again, that means that you're starting to save even as you're producing, you're saving, right? And that's pretty, that's pretty critical, right? Because it's very easy to say, oh, we got a lot of grain. We can use it. He's telling everybody, uh-uh, we got to hold on to it. We can use it, but we got to be holding on to it all the time. So that by the time we get to the seventh year of this, that seventh year, we've got to produce enough grains to get us through the next seven years, which means we got to save up a lot. And this is, again, the ability and, and the lesson, if you will, that we have from Joseph financially, which is we know just because you're having successful years doesn't mean you're supposed to spend to the limit of what you're earning. Because if you don't save during that time, when inevitably we're going to have lean times, when inevitably the market's going to shift, when inevitably home prices are going to go back down, inevitably when the cycle turns again, you better have resources to get through those times. And if you're really lucky and if you're really smart and if you're really good like Joseph, you'll be able to take advantage of that. And that's the lesson, the economic lesson of the Bible which is when people say, gosh, I wish I had bought when the market was down. It's because they, like everybody else, had no liquidity. And so Joseph creates a situation, as you're going to see, so that they could. That's what makes Joseph, again, a lesson for everybody when it comes to economics. Yep. He's going to learn. He's going to see. He's going to make sure that this policy is nationwide. Yep. Before the years of famine came, Joseph, which means assumedly again, this is during the seven, I mean, not assumedly, it's pretty clear. It's during the good years that he has good years too. Before the years of famine came, Joseph became the father of two sons, whom Osanat, the daughter of Potipharah, the priest of On, bore to him. And I think it's interesting that they're still calling her the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. It's like the Torah doesn't want you to forget who she really was. But it is what it is. People don't like, again, the fact that she is who she is. Because at this point, you could say, you know, his wife. She's not. She's still called the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. And Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, Manasseh, meaning God has made me forget completely my hardship, and my parental home. And again, if you look at the root, where, where, where do you get this from? It's from the word nash shani. So the word nash shani is connected to forgetting to the name Manasha. So he says his son's name is Manasha because God has made me forget. Now, Let's just think about this for a second. So his older son is Manasseh. His older son's given this name. God has made me forget. Now you could say, the first part, God's made me forget my hardship. That's wonderful. God has made me forget that my life for the last 13 years, now, well, that 13 years before I got married and, and, and now I'm like running to Egypt. I've forgotten it. God's made me forget it. I don't remember my hardship anymore. But that's not all it says. He's made me for, God has made me forget my parental home. Beit Avi, my father's house. And that's pretty critical. And people traditionally have not been comfortable with what Joseph just said here. Because what Joseph really just said here is that part of what God has helped me forget was what happened to me back when I was a kid. 
He's made me forget my childhood. And we would say, and again, this is why people have a problem with this traditionally, you've forgotten you're a Hebrew. Right. You forgot who you, where you came from. And you're thanking God for it. So this kind of blows our mind. And it blows the minds of the rabbis because on one hand, they want Joseph to be very traditional, very respectful of his father, never forgets his father, always keeping his Jewish tradition. Even while he's living amongst the Egyptians, he's not forgetting who he is. According to the Bible itself, it says that he did, or at least he wanted to, and he's thankful for it, which is ironic because he he says he thanks God. So it seems as though he's not giving up on God. He's not giving up his faith, which is obviously a positive thing. It's a good thing. But Beit Avi is saying, my father's house. He doesn't say he's made me forget what my brothers did to me. He's made me forget my father's house. So me. I mean, like, we forget this. is, And again, when we read this fast, we go right over this line. Somebody, what are you thinking now? Somebody tell me what you're thinking right now as you've just read this. Anybody, chime in right now. And, and, and it doesn't, it is sad, right? It is sad. Yeah. But it's interesting that he says, my father's house. Yeah, his, he was his father's favorite. But he says, I want to forget. God has made me forget. Um, which, of course, did he really forget? Did he really forget? Because how could he say that if he's forgotten it? But again, maybe he's saying, I kind of put it out of my mind. You know, I don't think, of, I don't think about it anymore. Could be, but it seems like he's grateful for it. He, by naming his son that, he seems to be thanking God for it. Um, anybody, anybody out there have any thoughts on this? Nobody. Okay. I will offer one other thing, which some people have pointed out to from this text, which is that maybe we just learned something about Joseph and how he's, how he's made sense of, of what's happened to him by this point, which is as much as he's worried about or, or remembers, you know, or, you know, having nightmares about his childhood. There's also a piece to this that might give something away here, which is, I've been here for 13 years. I was in prison. I was in Potiphar's house. No one's come looking for me. Why has my dad not found me? My dad's very wealthy. My dad has a lot of slaves. He's got a lot of people. Now, he doesn't know that his brothers have told the father that he's dead. He doesn't know that. We know that. We know that Joseph, Joseph's coat was torn up and put blood on it. They threw blood on it and brought it to the father and said he's dead. But he doesn't know that. So it's, it dawns on me the things that God made him forget our years of pain, uh, our years of loss of home, of loss of parents, it made him forget all his losses. So he named him something that was a blessing because the pain went away. Well, that's kind of what Francine, uh, Francine, you're muted, but you typed in there. Um, you typed in there something if you're, if you want to take your Oh. If you want to say what you meant by that, Francine. 
you wrote, maybe he does not feel as much emotional pain from, er from everything. Yeah, they say time heals everything, right? Um, maybe he just, you know, he had so many things that had changed in his life and it's so many years had passed that he just didn't feel the, the pain of all of it as much. And, you know, he had moved on a little bit. Um, doesn't say that he forgot, because otherwise, why would you name your, your firstborn the name that he did, like you said? But I think that the, if anyone's ever experienced, you know, some kind of loss or emotional pain, and eventually the pain does go away with time. Well, it's interesting because the reason that they translated it as completely my hardship. Uh, <laughs> well, here's, a, here's a weird, it all depends on where you, where you uh, punctuate it because we really don't. So here's the thing. It says, a call Amale, Amali, the Ed Cole Beit Avi, which the word Cole means all, completely, which is why they translate this completely. Uh -huh. So when it says Amal, the, the word Amali is my Amal, my, they translate as hardship. What does King James say? Toil. Amal could be toil, hardship. It's, 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 tough times, right? Well, years in prison are tough times. Oh, correct. But, <laughs> but does the coal only, is the coal only on my hardship or is the coal completely, which is not clear by the way they translated it, completely, has God made me forget completely my hardship and also completely my parental home? Or is it just completely my hardship and my parental home? Because on one hand, it could be You've made me forget where I came from completely. I don't even remember. I don't even think about it. Or has he? Uh, no, it's no, it's. <laughs> I just looked at it. It says Colbate Avi. It's completely both. <laughs> Scratch what I said before. Colbate Avi and Col Amali. It doesn't say I forgot my home. It's Colbate Avi. I forgot all of my home. I didn't notice that until just now. Yeah, the completely is on both. Uh, so what's the translation to King James? All my father's house. Yeah. So King James uh, translated it much more literally, which is forgot everything about my. Mm -hmm. house. So it's not just the bad parts of my father's house. It says my father's house, all of it. I forgot all of my father's house. I forgot everything about that. And that God made him do that. He, yeah. he didn't just forget it because yeah. he decided to forget it. God made him forget it and wiped it out. Yep. Yep. Now, again, has God literally wiped off his, that off his mind? Or has God allowed so much to happen to him that he's forgotten? Or has the fact that now he's been blessed in such a crazy way is that why he's forgotten it? Because he's in such a different circumstance. I mean, you can make that argument. He's like, I was thinking about it when I was back in prison a lot. But now that I'm here, I don't think about it anymore. I don't think but about it. But he doesn't say that. He said, God made me forget. Oh, yeah, yeah. But God, by God performing this wonderful miracle yeah. me into Pharaoh's house so that I can interpret the dream and do that. So God uh. did that, and now I don't have to think about it anymore. Because it could be that up until that time, he was thinking about it a lot. When things weren't going well, he was thinking about his brothers who threw him into a pit and got him into this situation. But now, yeah, the whole thing, it's water under the bridge. I don't think about it anymore. I'm, I'm, I don't think about it. It's over. It all worked out. Which actually, without ruining it, Joseph does say later on. But has he come to that point yet or is he in denial? He's in the, he's at the Nile, right? But he's in denial. Denial is not just a river. Denial is not just a river in Egypt that you see cows come out of. No, he he's, is he in denial? Does he feel that maybe again, though, God has given him this circumstance so that he can look back and say, I don't think about that anymore. I, I just, that's behind me. The irony is, is that that's the name of his son who winds up being one of the tribes of Israel. 
because remember the two sons are literally they they're raised as high up as Naphtali and Judah and all these other tribes. These guys get up there, way up there. We get blessed in the name of Ephraim and Manasseh. This is the names that are the ultimate names that we get blessed by. And ironically, there ah, I'm called Manasseh because I forgot where I came from completely. <laughs> So that's the irony. When we bless a child in the name of Manasseh, we're actually saying, yeah, the guy who forgot, the, the guy that was named because Joseph forgot everything of where he came from. I know what we're saying, we think we forgot, but like you said earlier, is just that you know, it happened. I, I have a beautiful life now. I have two kids. I have a wife. I'm in charge of Egypt. Yeah. Maybe. Because the reality is, is that if he really feels that God has put him in this, which is very possible, right? Because he's now one of the most power. He's the second most powerful man in the world. Not like second most powerful in like in the world. He's in charge of an empire. And so you can't get any higher than this unless you're born into it. So this is truly a miracle. I mean, he, he thinks that God, he believes that God put him there. Yep. And it seems as though that that's exactly what happened when he's put in the right place at the right time. So here is Ephraim's name. Ephraim. Tell us what Ephraim means. The second he named Ephraim, meaning God has made me fertile in the land of my affliction. Now, the word Hephrani, they connect with Ephraim. That, I mean, not he, we, the Hebrew. Hephrani means to be fertile. Now, what's interesting is, if you thought that he loves Egypt now, and he's doing really well in Egypt, he calls it the land of his affliction, which is really weird, because you could make the argument he was least as afflicted back at home when they threw him in a pit for no reason, tried to kill him. So, he and we know he doesn't really like his parental home because he seems to thank God for making him forget his parental home. But yet here in the next line, it says, Egypt is the land of my affliction. And what's so weird about it is we just said last week, or two, whatever, three days ago, Egypt is the land of our affliction. We call it the land of our affliction. We eat the bread of affliction. Lechem oni. It's the same word. Ani. This is the bread of affliction. This is the land of my affliction, Eretz Oni. He calls Egypt the land of his affliction. So even though he's been promoted to be the head of it, in his mind, he still called Ephraim the land of my affliction. He didn't say the land of my success, where my affliction turned into my success, but God's made me fertile in the land of my affliction. So what's interesting about Joseph's naming of his children and where he is at this moment I got news for you. Based on the names of his two children, what he says, what the Bible says he says, what's the con I mean, what's the consequence of this? What do you take away from this? He doesn't want to go back to his home. He doesn't think his home is something he wants to remember, but he still calls Egypt the land of his affliction. So this is a man with nothing, no place for all of his wealth, for all of his success. He doesn't feel at home in Egypt because it's the land of his affliction. That's what he called it. I didn't call it that. He called it that. And he also says, I want, I thank God for making me forget my home. Where is this man who we, again, no one is more successful than him in the whole world who's ever earned anything because the Pharaoh was born into it. This guy, Joseph, earned it. Nobody is more successful than him in the whole world. And yet this man is a man of no country, a man of no home because he can't go back home doesn't want to go back home, doesn't want to think about home, and he calls this land that he's had so much success the land of his affliction. I'm just telling you, those two lines are throwaway lines. They're lines that we never read. They're lines that we never think about. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that they're two of the most powerful lines in Joseph's story, at least where he is at this moment as a 30-something-year-old man, and he looks around his life and says, what do I have? Why? Names. The names, yeah. yeah the names are like opposites. They're opposites, but they're both reflective of a father who doesn't have a place. Mm 
This man has no place. Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond. <laughs> Something like that, right? Yeah. He's a man. Yeah. So for all the success of Neil Diamond, for all the success of Joseph, there is something missing. There's some, there's some part of him that's never can never feel at home, can never feel at home because I can't go back. I don't want to go back, but I, I still see this land as, my, as the place of my affliction. Now, again, he's only a few years out of the affliction. So, you know, it's still, yeah, it's still but it's still fresh in his mind. It's a guy who's still, well, he's still, when he names him, it's still within that seven years. So it's like four or five, whatever. Yeah, so whatever. It's during this time. But the point is, is that, Maybe it's still fresh in his mind. Maybe he didn't feel like that by the time he was, you know, 70. But at this point, he's still saying he had, two, he had a bad day both times. This guy is a guy who names his kids. You can't get anything more powerful than naming your kids, you know, with, with, with you giving them your hopes, your dreams. And, and what did you give away? This is a man who's clearly feeling a sense of even while he's recognizing his blessings i'm not i don't really have anywhere what's so powerful about this as i already shared with you we name we 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 not only use those names we invoke their names every time we give a blessing to a kid may you be like a Friam and Manasseh, uh-huh. named after forgetfulness and being fertile in the land of my affliction these are names that recount a parent's struggle at that time with their identity. I think it's a very human thing. I think it's a very powerful thing because it tells us that our ancestors, not only as we've talked about many times, that our ancestors are not only very real and very fallible, but they had pain and that these names carry that pain. It carries that with with them where their father was who their father was and to some extent again maybe that healing will happen later as we get to the story as we go through the story but not yet so for all of his success there's a piece of him that's that's very troubled the seven years of abundance that the land of egypt enjoyed came to an end And the seven years of famine set in, just as Joseph had foretold. There was famine in all the lands, but throughout the land of Egypt, there was bread. And I will tell you, by the way, just as Joseph had foretold, is another way of saying that, which is just as God had told Pharaoh, just as God had told Joseph, you know, again, like God sent the message, but Joseph foretold it. And Joseph is now, again, the reason for the success. There was famine in all the lands, but throughout the land of Egypt, there was bread. (laughs) So yeah, it says Lechem. Uh, And when all the land of Egypt felt the hunger, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Whatever he tells you to do, you shall do. Don't come to me. I don't know. (laughs) It's Joseph. Joseph's the one in charge. Joseph is the one in charge. So they want bread. First, the people of Egypt feel the hunger, right? The people of Egypt felt it. It's the Egyptians. But they already run out. They're the first to run out because they had food. They were storing it up. They're storing it up. They don't have it, which meant that the Egyptians felt the famine too, at least at least at first. And you're going to see why they felt the famine. Accordingly, when the famine became severe in the land of Egypt, Joseph laid open all that was within and rationed out grain to the Egyptian. The, the Egyptians, the famine, however, spread over the whole world. So, Joseph 
responds with rationing out the grain to the Egyptians. He doesn't say he gave them to them. He rationed them. And the famine was terrible. It was got, it got worse. It, the word is it got, it got, it got strong, the famine. So the famine is, it's, it's severe in the land of Egypt. Now it's spreading around the world, which is interesting because it seems as though the fair, the famine actually started in Egypt, which is weird because, you know, again, it's also the place where they have the grain stored, but it radiates out. And all the world came to Joseph in Egypt to procure rations for the famine had become severe throughout the world, which the famine spread. And now it's severe throughout the world. Same thing is it's famine is spread. It's strong. And that is the end of the chapter. And that's the way the chapter ends, right? The chapter ends with, the famine got very bad. Now, I will tell you this. We're going to read just a couple verses into this next chapter, and we'll come back next week. But I will show... Yeah, we have class next week. Not Tuesday, but Wednesday. So, um, it says here, when Jacob saw that there were food rations to be had in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at one another? which is interesting because it tells us that they knew that there was a problem, but Jacob says to his sons, J Joseph's brothers, what are you doing about it? You're just looking around. What's the King James translation? Oh, it's okay. Sorry. Give her. Yeah, you, why do you look at one another is, is the, 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 uh, this, the, the meaning of it seems to be you're just looking, you're not doing anything. You're looking around at each other like someone's going to do something. No one's doing anything. And Jacob says, now I hear, he went on, that there are rations to be out in Egypt. Go down and procure rations for us there that we may live and not die. Pretty clear. It's the way we're going to live. So 10 of his brothers went down to get grain rations in Egypt. For Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, since he feared that he might meet with disaster. That is where we're going to finish now. Um, well, actually, we'll read one more line. Um, Thus the sons of Israel were among those who came to procure rations, for the famine extended to the land of Canaan. So, um, Does it ever say why he feared that Benjamin would die? Did he get messages? Did he intuit it? Did he honor Benjamin? Did he... Uh, well, look, he, the, 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 the plain... The plain the plain meaning here. The plain meaning here. Is, is Do you want that, to put my ears? Is that it says he feared that he might meet with disaster. Yes. So why him and not anybody else? It says. It says why he didn't want to do it. Why he didn't want to send Benjamin. Why he wouldn't do it? Because he he feared that he might meet with disaster. So. Oh. John, what were you going to say? Glory has something to say. Hi. Okay. So my version says uh, he did not want to send Benjamin, Joseph's brother. Their mo mother, Rachel, had died, and Jacob thought Joseph also was dead. Jacob did not want to lose Benjamin, the remaining son of his beloved Rachel. Oh. Oh. So no, so that's so that's, no, so that's, 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 that's the, that's the that's understanding, the, right? Understanding, right? That, that Joseph and Benjamin are full. And if the brothers did this to Joseph, not take good enough care of them or whatever, 
the oh, judge. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. According to what? Uh, according to what uh, but I mean, but, it makes sense. He lost his sense. son. He, lost his son. That he loved. That he loved. Great. He doesn't want to risk the other. He doesn't want to risk the other. Benjamin. Benjamin. I'm getting this feedback. I'm getting this feedback. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, it's, it's it's a, a bad, bad. bad. I don't know what to do about that. I don't know what to do. So, what, so hold on, hold on. Oh. I'm going to fix it. Don't worry. I'm going to fix it. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I got to figure. No. So, oh, that's even worse. <laughs> so, one second. There, thank you. So, what happens? is that the story of Benjamin not getting sent becomes the critical part of the story. That's what's, that's what we're going to read about next week. Why Benjamin, you know, Benjamin's being held back is the critical part of the next chapter. This is, this is the narrative device that lets the whole story go. So the fact that Benjamin is Joseph's full brother is you know, something that is going on in Jacob's head. But again, this is the key part of, this is the key part of the story. And again, you can make the argument that Benjamin is the youngest son. You know, he's, he's the, you know, he's the, you, you wouldn't want to send him on a journey because he's so young, but he's not that young by this point, right? He's, he's, a, he's, he's, well, Joseph's 30. So Benjamin's probably, well, Benjamin's at least like 15 or 16 by this point. So, you know, he's, he's not a kid. And, um, you know, he, he doesn't, Joseph is, Joseph's already met with a bad fate, at least according to what Jacob knows, why would, why would he do this? So, um, this is a critical part of the rest of the, yeah, I know. I mean, that's a critical part of the story. We're, we're going to, I want to, yeah, but I didn't want to get into that because that's what I didn't. They're, they're, I, I don't want to ruin the next chapter because that's the critical part. The Benjamin story is actually an amazing story, and it's the next chapter, chapter 42. And so this is a, a critical part of it. But look, we're also going to see next week that Joseph just did something which was amazing, which was he saved his country, but he did it we'll talk about it next week but joseph actually does something um which could really tick off not only the egyptians but everybody else which is something that the jewish people have been known to do which is sometimes be too successful for our own good i'm not arguing that that's something we shouldn't do (laughs) we shouldn't do we're not talking about individual jews we're not talking about individual jews mike we're talking about us as a people as a, in general which is that in many countries in many places uh we didn't overstay our welcome we we just were so successful that people said we got to do something about these people so whether it was in it was there was in egypt uh, as we're about to see as we, oh, actually as we talked about it passover happened in spain happened during throughout European history, when European Jews, uh, Jewish communities got too wealthy, and then they owed too much money to the Jews that they would chase them out or force them out or kill them. Uh, This was a regular occurrence. And of course, it was part of what happened in Nazi Germany as well. One of the reasons why Hitler was able to uh, get so many people to, uh, to uh, participate in, in genocide and to participate initially just in, in disenfranchising Jews is because there was a huge amount of wealth that had uh, become part of, of, of Jewish families during, during, during the Weimar Republic. And I mean, it started before, but there were Jews who had, had done reasonably well during the war. And uh, there was a feeling that Jews had not suffered as badly as other Germans had it. And, you know, it's difficult to, to measure 
the effects of of poverty during during the de the, the depression, but there were people who said the same thing in the United States that Jews were uh, profiteering, that Jews had had profited during World War One, that Jews were profiting uh, disproportionately during during uh, the depression, and that was a you know I don't need to tell you, but that period was a huge there was a huge wave of anti-Semitism and the KKK grew in in uh, in in uh, in America. And it was one of the reasons why, again, there was a, a, a healthy dose of anti-Semitism in our country during the 1930s as well. It wasn't just. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, this is what Ken Burns is exactly. Yeah, it's exactly working on this issue of of what happened. What? Yeah. What happened during the 20s and 30s in this country and the anti-Semitism that was directed uh, at, at, at Jews? I mean, there was. Father Coughlin had a had a week you know had a weekly radio program where he where he, you know, disseminated horrible anti-Semitism uh, directed primarily at Jews who were who he would argue he said were controlling the banks and controlling the you know, uh, you know manipulating the market so that the average person suffered and it's stuff that we still hear today. I mean, it's stuff that we will still hear <clears throat> in our country uh, today, and and people have seen it in. People saying that the war in Russia and in Ukraine is being manipulated by Jews who are who are profiteering and who are, uh, you know, somehow behind this war in in uh, in Ukraine right now. There were uh, homes in Beverly Hills were were uh, plastered this last week with uh, with uh, flyers right. with a, 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 a you know a sheet that basically said Jews are profiting from the war in Ukraine. So yeah, this is still something that we have. You'll see what happens as Joseph. Um, uh, just you know, his plan was to some extent uh, too successful, and and would would hatred be directed at Joseph? And one can make the argument: Were Joseph's people targeted later on for being too successful at one point? Did we wind up as slaves to some extent, not just because you know Pharaoh was worried, as it says, they would rise up against our enemies, but which is something else that the Nazis said about the Jews, but were Jews also still resented for Joseph and for Joseph's family that inherited and did well from Joseph's success. So this is something that is uh, ex exceptionally relevant historically and, and currently. So um, we will talk about that next week. And uh, again, as we wrap up today and think about um, Joseph's, where Joseph is at this point, um, we're set up now because we've gone back to Canaan and you're seeing what's happening back in the land. So again, look forward to seeing everybody uh, next week. Have a great rest of Pesach. Have a great Pesach. rest of the holiday. Um, I don't know. Un yeah, definitely unmute yourself. Yeah, definitely unmute yourself. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Good to see y'all. Bye bye. Awesome. Take care. <laughs>